The centric rafter counting chamber is a traditional and commonly used tool employed for water analysis and culture inspection. Its application enables the enumeration and identification of algae or zooplankton suspended in water. The chamber or cell holds a known volume of liquid, which is intended to be representative of the largest volume of the sample, which in its turn is representative of the sample source. The principle is to take a representative sample of the source, say from a pool or pond or from a stretch of seawater, and then by preparing and preserving the sample, a small amount or quantity can be examined under the microscope. The results of a species count in that small known volume possibly repeated and multiplied, can be then scaled up to produce an estimate of the volume in the sample as a whole. Now, although this may be one use for the Cedric Rafter chamber today, back in 1889, when William Cedric and George Rafter developed the enumeration technique, uh, their main area of interest was the purity, or otherwise, of drinking water. At the turn of the 20th century, George Whipple, use a Cedric rafter cell in conjunction with a grid in a microscope eyepiece, one of his own design, and he was looking at the quality of water supplies. Um, his research led directly to the chlorination of drinking water. Now, the Cedric rafter chamber will enclose one milliliter of water trapped within the cell frame beneath the cover glass. It can be difficult to fill without trapping bubbles, but I'll show you a technique or method of filling. Now the cell can be used with either living or preserved material. To fill the cell, first we must place our cover glass over the chamber along its border here at an angle. Now that's gap at both sides, you'll notice. So this is one side to fill from and one side to allow the air bubbles to escape during the filling procedure. And this is our sample that's well distributed, well mixed and measured a sample and we need one milliliter at least into a wide neck pipette. Okay, and we fill from one edge here, keeping the pipette nice and flat and just fill through like this. turn at last and there we have it okay so that's now full now you must be careful you don't overfill because you don't want the um, cover slip to float free in fact you like surface tension to hold it close down onto the cell wall itself now before we can make a cell count with the Cedric rafter we need to leave it to settle for 15 minutes to allow all the algae and other particles to settle to the bottom of the chamber. Now this can be left on a microscope or not. Um, if you have a cool illuminated LED type microscope, it might be fine on the microscope. But if you're using a halogen illuminated microscope, um, it could get warm and could cause small air bubbles to appear underneath the, the actual cover glass due to evaporation. In fact, with a halogen microscope, this can happen even during the count. So to prevent bubbles forming, if you take a, a small drop of distilled water and just place it on the edge of the chamber, a small drip against the side wall here like this, and then that will prevent bubbles forming um, during the actual evaporation of the sample away. Now, the base of the Cedric rafter can be plain or gridded. This is a gridded model, and this one here is a plain base model. Now, Pizer manufacture both types. The clear base version is intended for use with a Whipple grid or an index grid in the eyepiece of the microscope. Uh, the view of the chamber is moved, and random locations and counts of the subject are taken using the eyepiece uh, grid as a guide. Now, this method does require you to know what magnification you're operating at, so you can actually calculate the volume of the area covered by the grid and in the reticule. Now, the gridded version, on the other hand, there is no need for a reticule at all here. Um, the square pattern on the floor of the chamber becomes the guide, 
It's ideal for use with a stereo zoom microscope without the need to carefully set up the precise zoom or magnification before counting the sample. There are a thousand squares across this uh, one milliliter chamber, so each one of the squares marks off a column with a volume of one microliter. Any number of squares can be randomly moved into the field of view and a population count of a particular subject can be made for each of the microliter volumes. These counts are then averaged and multiplied up to estimate the density of a population in a sample body or an area of water. So let's take a more detailed look at the Cedric Rafter Chamber and how it's actually used in practice. Now remember first of all to recap, cover at an angle, fill from one edge with a hole for the bubbles to escape so you fill the chamber fully to its one milliliter limit. We then allow the chamber to settle for about 15 minutes before placing it onto our observation microscope. Now it's important to let it settle and also ensure that we've got an even distribution of our sample. Now this is a sort of view that you get under a microscope of a gridded based cedric rafter. This is a live sample as you can probably see at the moment. Now there are quite commonly used other cedric rafter chambers, the same one milliliter amount within the chamber walls but with no gridded bottom. Now you have no idea of what area you're looking at other than the field of view so you tend to use a Whipple grid or some other grid in the eyepiece to identify a known counting area or volume for the sample itself. Now I did say that these were live samples as indeed this one is and there are obviously difficulties in getting an accurate count. The first thing of course is that the protozoa are moving around and they are swimming within the one millimeter depth of the water so some are in focus, some are out of focus due to depth of field. So what we really need to do is preserve and stain the sample to make it prepared so that everything sits nice and still or if you prefer dead. Um, Lugos is a good agent for this but it can be detrimental to the larger animals in the sample but it's not a problem for these protozoa. So if we look at this particular area we can work out how to do a count, a population estimate if you will. So taking one square there are three protozoa in this area and the square to the right there are two. So that's five in total across two squares is an average of two and a half per square or two and a half per microliter volume. You'll also note if you look at those two squares there is a third or sorry a second uh, protozoa there, we'll call it type B, and uh, the average population in these two squares is half a protozoa per microliter volume. So what do we do with this information? Well looking at the red protozoa again, we're able to scale this population count up based on the fact that there are a thousand squares in the chamber and there are two and a half per square, so that means there are two and a half thousand of these protozoa in the chamber as a whole and scaling that further that's one milliliter for the chamber means there's two and a half million in a liter of the same sample liquid. Well that's very oversimplified. You wouldn't count, <laughs> you would count an average a lot more than just two squares, you'd look randomly across the whole chamber floor itself. Um, you'd also repeat that from the sample several times to ensure you've got an even distribution of the sample across the actual slide itself.